all who listen me from far and near this evening. Greetings you all once again. In the most and blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today, I would like to make a small comment about the portion of scripture which actually we read in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 on. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 very often the Bible students have asked several questions about this passage of scripture whether the passage is essentially speaking about the unsaved people or the born again ones implicating the possibility of one losing his salvation once he received the Lord Jesus Christ. Basing my explanations the portion I would like to invite your attention particularly to this passage I will read it for you first of all Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 to 36 Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. In the above words, that means 26 on, it very particularly is inviting our attention. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no, no, no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy, the testimony of two or three witnesses. Then, verse number 29, the writer is asking a very important question. And he is asking here, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the spirit. Some people having examined this biblical passage, they are of the opinion that a person, even after he received the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart as his own personal Savior, he can lose his salvation by tumbling down the Son of God under his foot and uh, despising him in his life. When I examine this passage of scriptures, like any other passages, I have uh, got the understanding of this particular passage is very much connected to <coughs> chapter 6 of the same book, <coughs> verse, verses from 3 onwards. Chapter 6 verse 3 to 9 and uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 to 29 are speaking of the same group of people. I would uh, name them the people who are apostate. Even before also I have made very uh, certain comments about these passages. And as, as it speaks by the Spirit of God, that it is not necessary speaking about the saved people, but those who are of unsaved. 
And when we study the book of Hebrews, the epistle of Hebrews, you and I will have to understand one thing, that is, the writer has three different group of people in his mind when he was writing this book. The first group was those born-again Christians who are matured in their faith and in their assurance. And the second group of people comes to the category of unsaved people. And the third group are a particular a group of people who are though born again, but they are striving to come into Christian maturity. Keeping these three different groups of people uh, before us, we will have to understand the epistle that means all the 13 chapters are addressed to mainly the Hebrew Christians. It doesn't necessarily mean all those who are reading these epistles are really born again. But these three different groups of people are there. Those who are saved but not matured enough, or not those who are saved but not brought into Christian maturity, and those who are saved and they are mature now, and those who have heard the gospel yet hardened their heart and they did not believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Here the writer is giving a solemn warning to the readers. That means this, there are five solemn warnings in the epistle of Hebrews. On one occasion I have very clearly explained about all the five solemn warnings. And here in chapter 10, verse 26, he says, for if you sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, is, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. See the practical emphasis the writer of this epistle is giving here is the, he is highlighting the importance of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. He says, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was a sacrifice, supreme sacrifice ever offered in the history and uh, there remains no longer any sacrifice for the sins of the people because that is the final sacrifice which have brought salvation to mankind. So he says that therefore if any, any man willfully a sin after we have received the knowledge. Some people, they falsely interpret that since Paul has used the, the, the pronoun we, the plural form, plural, in, the, in the plural form, they interpret that the passage include the speaker, that means Paul himself, because he uses the term there, if anyone willfully sin uh, since we received or since we received the knowledge of the truth. And Paul is standing there in the common community. We have to understand that Paul is standing here in the common community. And then he is addressing the readers of this epistle saying that there is a danger which is ahead. What is the danger? The danger is that people who have received the knowledge of the truth yet willfully sinning. That's the subject here. See, some misunderstand the knowledge of the truth is actually one attaining or receiving the knowledge of the truth is one receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Not necessarily. Because in chapter 6, Paul says, see, the, the fivefold different privileges of the people who have read this book. In chapter 6, Paul is speaking about the five for the different privileges the people had. What are, what, what are those privileges that he mentions here? He says, and uh, see, from verse number uh, 4 onwards, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. 
since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. See the special privileges of the people who read this book. What are they? Paul says uh, one after the other here numbering. And he says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. And these people about whom Paul is mentioning here in chapter 6 verse 4 and 5 and 6 and also in chapter 10 verse 26 to 29 are a group of people who have heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and they have been enlightened. The word enlightened doesn't mean that these people have received the Lord. See, the gospel is presented to a general society, a society which contains people of different walks of life. See, what happened here? The gospel, even, even when all the apostles were preaching in the first century, and down from the first century till this day, that we all are preaching and presenting the, uh, the Savior Lord Jesus Christ to the general public. When the people hear it, so some people will be repenting of their sins and they be, they be accepting the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart. As a result, they will be born again or they will be saved. But some people, time and again, they listen the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet they are unwilling to receive the Lord Jesus Christ because of their adamant nature. They do not want to receive the Lord. And therefore, what happened? Paul says that they have... Uh, now and then they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet they are willfully sinning against the Holy Spirit of God. They are willfully sinning against, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. The Holy Spirit of God had enlightened their mind and their heart, convincing them the necessity of receiving the saving knowledge of Jesus. That means the Holy Spirit of God has several times convinced them enlightened their mind, spoke to them very clearly, son, uh, son, you are a sinner, daughter, you are a sinner, and uh, you need a savior, and the savior is none but the Lord Jesus Christ, who have completed his final sacrifice on the cross by giving up his body on our behalf. Even though this uh, audience have several times attended these messages, and the Holy Spirit of God was pleading with them to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet willfully, they avoided Him. That means, willfully, they did not accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So such people, Paul says, and they, these people, the first privilege, they were enlightened. And they have tasted the heavenly gift. They have not eaten the heavenly gift, but they have simply tasted the heavenly gift. Here different, the, you understand uh, the difference between eating and tasting. For example, when our Lord Jesus Christ on the cro uh, was on the cross, that in the final moment that he said, I thirst. Jesus cried on the cross by saying, I thirst. Then we know the centurion, uh, one of the centurions uh, gave him uh, the water, the, you know, the deep in, it, in, in, a, in a, the, the spong deep in a, uh, in a water, kind of water, which was actually a mixture of water, which was helpful for the dying one to uh, uh, make him not known how much pain that he was suffering. And at the moment that he takes the water, that he will go into faint that he would not know the pain very seriously, but he, eventually he would die. Jesus knew that. And when he had tasted it, that he wasn't able to drink it, that he was unwilling to drink it. They, he, they, they spotted that sponge to his tongue, and when he had tasted it, that he was unwilling to take it in. Because Jesus came to suffer pain on our behalf, not to go into pain not knowing the pain, how he was dying. So gee, he was unwilling to take that, the mixture, which uh, was given to his tongue by the centurion. And he says, see, those who have begun, they tasted the heavenly gift. When Jesus Christ was here on the earth, 
that he was performing so many miracles and signs. And he turned the water into wine, and he fed the five thousand with the five loaves of bread and two fish, and then he had done so many miracles. All the miracles what he performed is in the Holy Bible, especially the four Gospels. But uh, those people who followed him, all the people who followed him, they did not believe in him. Some have, some some followed him with the purpose of uh, filling their stomach with the, the the food which he supplies, and some actually followed him for healing ministry, and some followed to criticize him, some followed to learn of him and learn from him. See, people from different different groups or different walks of life with a different perspectives follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, these people have par par partially uh, tasted the the gift, the heavenly gift, which is the Lord Himself. But they full, they did not fully uh, eaten Him by faith in their heart. And Jesus in John's Gospel said that unless you eat me, eat my flesh and drink of my blood, that uh, you will have no eternal life. People they wrongly uh, or misinterpret the passage and they say that it is about eating the little flesh of Jesus and little blood of uh, Jesus. It is quite impossible. Even the Pharisees and the scribes who heard Jesus saying that unless you eat my flesh and take part from my blood that you'll have eternal life. They marvel at him asking that what do you say that can we eat your flesh? Can we drink your blood? No, Jesus was not talking about literally eating his flesh or drinking his blood. Rather, eating him as a bread of life for their salvation and bringing him for as a, as a drink, drink which leads them into eternal life. But they could not understand what Jesus spoke to them. So here actually lies the point. The, of all the privileges which God gave to these Jewish people, first of all, they have been enlightened by the hearing of the gospel, but they did not receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, they have tasted the heavenly gift when they had become the partakers of the blessings of the sign which Jesus performed the marriage at Cana at Galilee and also in multiplying the five breads into feeding the 5,000. They all participated partially from that heaven gift. And then it says, and, and, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. The, in the other occasion also, I had very well explained this passage based on the root meaning of this uh, particular phrase which is used by the Holy Spirit of God here. And the English Bible, when we read it that uh, it says that they became the partakers of the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, the people generally get a, 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 an idea, idea that these people of whom that Paul is talking about here in this passage were the people who become the partakers of the Holy Spirit of God. What is that? There is a word which is basically used in Greek. They are metagos. Metagos means association, accompaniment, but it necessarily doesn't mean possession. These people, while the Lord Jesus Christ was here in his earthly days, they accompanied the Holy Spirit of God because all the miracles and the signs and the messages which Jesus Christ delivered and performed in his earthly days, especially three and a half years of his uh, earthly ministry, that he did all of them in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That was in Matthew's Gospel chapter 12, these uh, Pharisees are and uh, scribes, they came to accuse him that he was uh, sitting off or he was casting off the demons with the head of the uh, demons, which is called Belzebub. Belzebub, they considered as the head of the demons. Then Jesus said that when I cast off the devils, demons and devils by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, you ascribed it to the power of the Belzebub, who is the head of the uh, demons. And Jesus uh, uh, Jesus told them that what they have ascribed was quite an unpardonable sin under those, those, that community because they, they doubted the power of the Spirit of God. Here, actually, when the Lord Jesus Christ performed all the miracles and when the Lord Jesus Christ 
did all the signs and even when he delivered all the messages of the kingdom and the messages of the the gospel of the kingdom that the power which was on operation was the power of the holy spirit of god therefore those people who have accompanied him in his earthly ministry days and the people who associated him in his earthly ministry days uh, so naturally speaking became the partakers of the holy spirit of god but doesn't mean that doesn't the text doesn't says they possess the holy spirit of god a person can possess the holy spirit of god only at is personally exercising his faith upon the the substitutionary death of jesus christ by which he receives him in the heart as his own personal savior alone unless a sinner believes the lord jesus christ and accepts him in the heart as his own personal savior the holy spirit of god will not come in him bible says the very moment a sinner believes in the lord jesus christ and accepted him that the same time the spirit of god comes to his heart and begin to dwell with him and since then he is, is having the inwelling experience of the holy spirit of god but really these people were just uh, the associating with the holy spirit of god and uh, accompanying him so the writer says that they have uh, become the partakers of the holy spirit not the process the possessors of the holy spirit and it says and again they have tasted the good works of god and the powers of the age to come good works of the lord that's a the Uh, the the miracles which Jesus performed, and also the powers of the age to come. The powers of the age to come is simply the power powers which he performed in the miracles of Jesus. That means the power which was demonstrated in the miracles and signs of Jesus Christ is the same. That is the power power of the age that is to come. That is the same power that Christ is going to demonstrate when he establishes his kingdom for one thousand years. after the great tribulation so let me go on to say this particular subject pure paul says here what it is impossible to those who were once enlightened and they have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the holy spirit and have tasted the good word of god and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance See the, pro, the the group of people Paul is talking about in this particular passage. He, for them, Paul says that it is impossible to bring them back into repentance. But what the Bible teaches us, if a believer uh, he commits sins, the Bible says that there is chances for him to get repented and then get uh, re- reconciled. For example, Peter, he fall away from Christ at the time of his crucifixion. That he said that I I knew him not. He denied him publicly before those uh, those, those uh, Roman officers and those uh, Roman people. See here, when he had basically done, we see read in the book of John's Gospel, chapter twenty-one, Christ after his resurrection reconciled and reinstated Peter from his fallen state. It speaks that whenever a believer is fall a uh, fell in sin or is basically done, that he can be reconciled to fellowship. And he can be re- reinstated from his vital vital state. But the pe- particular group of people concerning whom here Paul is talking about, they cannot be brought back to repentance, which clearly tell us that this passage is essentially not speaking about the saved ones, but of the unsaved. In the same in a similar way, in chapter ten, verse twenty-nine to twenty uh, nine, twenty-six to twenty-nine, Paul says, "For if we sin willfully," After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. See, the Paul is warning them: these uh, apostate people. Who is an apostate? People have different interpretation about the uh, apostates, and people give different uh, interpretations or definitions on the apostates. Apostates, apostates, according to the Bible, is a person who is intellectually enlightened, but willfully rejected the salvation. Who is intellectually in, uh, enlightened is of his mind, but willfully rejected the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For example, we have spoken the gospel of Jesus Christ to some people for several times. 
each time that we speak to them, the Spirit of God is enlightening his mind to understand the necessity of receiving the Lord Jesus Christ in his heart. But even after 10 or 15 or 20 times that we speak to him, time and again we speak to them that he kept on hardening his heart against the grace of God. And then, even though the Holy Spirit of God has several times enlightened his mind to the truth, but he willfully rejected it. And such people, the uh, Paul says here, and uh, they willfully disobeying God, or they are willfully sinning against God. For if you if you sin will if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, and then they received the knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ, who is he and what for he has come and what he has wrote about on the cross of Calvary by his sacrificial death. And they know they knew that there is a heaven and a hell. And they knew repentance, repentance is the only means by which a person can be generator of his faith in Jesus Christ and accepted him. They knew all these things pertaining to salvation, but they did not receive the Lord Jesus Christ into their heart. Such one, Paul is talking about here, if such people willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, then no longer reminds a sacrifice. That Paul was saying, Christ's sacrifice was the final sacrifice and there is no more remains a sacrifice for the sins of God's uh, sins, sin aids. And then he says, but certain fearful expectation of dead men and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And here in verse number 29 he solemnly explained the seriousness of the rejection of truth. He says of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be uh, thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot. That means willfully, this trampling the Son of God underfoot means willfully rejecting the, the way of salvation which God has provided through Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says Jesus Christ is the only Savior of this world. The only Savior of the sinners. And when God had a given uh, and demonstrate the Son of God on the Mount Calvary as the only Savior to the end uh, sin, sin of the end of the world, these people willfully rejected Him. And says therefore, how much worse per punishment do you? Suppose will He be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God on the foot and then counted the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified a common thing. Many people, they misunderstand this passage as, as, it, as, it is, as if it is talking about the saved one by the, the phrase which the Holy Spirit of God used here that, uh, the, by which he is sanctified. What is the meaning of the word sanctification in the Bible? The word sanctification is uh, coming from a Greek word hagiasu. Hagiasu, the Greek word hagiasu uh, has the meaning to set, set apart or to place apart for a particular purpose set apart or placing apart for a particular purpose. For example, we read in the book of Leviticus and Exodus, the days in which the tabernacle was, uh, you know, summited in the presence of God, uh, here in the high priest, he took the holy oil, oil in a horn and went into the sanctuary and he sanctified, the, sanctified all the instruments including the, in the tabernacle for the service of the Almighty God. Sanctified means he set apart it. That means he placed it apart. That he has placed it apart for a particular purpose. The place was dedicated. That means placed apart or sanctified to offer sacrifices and worship to the Almighty and living God. That is the meaning. So the word Haniyasu in its result and the meaning in the New Testament perspective is actually placing apart or setting apart for a particular purpose. Here in this passage, the, the word uh, sanctif sanctified or sanctification does not necessarily speak about the hearer of the gospel, but in this passage it is speaking about the provider of the gospel. Whose sanctification? What is that? God in time past has sanctified the Son of God to become the sacrifice for the sin sins of people. That means God in the past Sanctified, that means set apart the Son of God, who is the second person in the Godhead, to become a sacrifice for the sin of the world. 
and that was the reason when Jesus Christ was walking by the seashore of Galilee, John the Baptist saw him, he publicly proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of sin of the world. So our, our Lord Jesus Christ has been uh, separated or sanctified in the eternity past itself by the triune God to become a sacrifice for the sin of the uh, people in this world. And that is the idea, idea means here. The, the uh, sanctified a common thing means that Jesus Christ was sanctified as a common cause for, cause for the entire, entire sin of the world by the Father God in heaven in the eternity past. And Paul is speaking about uh, such a uh, situation. That means God has placed him apart even from time past to become a sacrifice for our sins. And uh, he has provided uh, salvation for all mankind by his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. And now it is made available to all people by means of repentance and faith to trust him so that they will be delivered out of the uh, judgment which is expected. <coughs> what Paul says here in the following verses, Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. <coughs> we have three witnesses in heaven. John's, in John's epistle, First John, Apostle Paul says there are three who witnesses in heaven. Who else are they? Spirit and the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, and then who oh, the 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 water, the spirit, the blood, and the water. So listen here: that the 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 spirit of God, the blood of Christ, and God the Father is also directly witnessing him. And here, when we stand there in front of the great judgment seat of God, we read in the book of Revelation that the books were often. And another book was, was opened whose name was the book of life. All those whose names were found not written in the book of life, they were cast out into the lake of fire. And this is called the second death, we read in Revelation chapter 20. So the seriousness of the, the end of the unsaved people are very solemnly mentioned in these two passages, Hebrew chapter 6 and Hebrew chapter 10. Therefore, you understand that here the word, the Spirit of God is using that of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, count of the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. That means the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was set apart or placed apart or sanctified from all eternity before for the sanctification of the sinners. That means that blood, the blood of the covenant, and even when Jesus Christ shed his blood, that even when he uh, established that uh, his, uh, you know, the Lord's table uh, at the, on, in, the, in the upper chamber, just prior to his departure from there to the crucifixion, he said that this is the blood of my covenant, this is the blood of my covenant. So this uh, covenant, the blood of the covenant we are talking about, the blood which is shed for us on the cross of Calvary, which was in the heart of Jesus. So listen here. So he says that Jesus Christ was set apart or placed apart by God the Father from all eternity. And uh, the blood which he shed on the cross of Calvary was the blood of the covenant. And if you and I reject willfully that blood of covenant, that means the blood of Jesus Christ. Suppose a sinner... Having, having heard several times about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the necessity of regeneration, yet he says himself that I do not need the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, if he uh, pay no value to the blood of Jesus which was shed on the cross of Calvary, Bible says, for such people there is no other means of salvation but only the judgment which is suspected. That means... Those who did not hear the words of Moses, the law, did not obey the law of Moses, or he did, did not obey the, the word of Moses, with the two or three witnesses that he was put to death. In the same way, Bible says that if you willfully reject the Lord Jesus Christ, or the salvation which God the Father has provided for the entire mankind, uh, to possess it by trusting him, 
into a person's heart as his own personal savior our lord then finally what will happen if he willfully rejects him that he will be rejected of under the eternal punishment which is the lake of fire so therefore may i close this passage explanation by this uh, remark that hebrews chapter 6 verse number 3 to 9 and hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 to 29 are not necessarily speaking about the born again saved people but of the unsaved people who are several times heard the gospel of jesus christ but had willfully and deliberately rejected the provision of god's salvation i hope that you understand the explanation very well and if you have any doubts concerning what i have so far explained to you you are free to ask me in my whatsapp number 9957157708 or you can call me and i will clarify you on the basis of the word of god which stands unchanged may god bless you all thank you in his service evangelist titus from idiambla thank you